just get some idea. I mean, this is not a very exciting title, is it? But um, there is something, there are some interesting messages in this initiative. Could I just get an idea where some of you are from? My, my background is physical sciences, um, so I'm quite relatively new to ANS. Could I just get an idea of the sort of areas that you people from? Computer science. Computer science, library. Physical sciences, where may I ask? I was, I was a part of the physicist, but now I'm in research. <laughs> Just one or two of you, sir? Okay. Computer science, <laughs> IT, okay, not anyone from the government here? No? Um, no, okay, that, that gives me a reasonable idea. All right, um, what I'm going to cover today is the Gov government 2.0 initiative. Um, I am the first one of those speakers. The other person is Andrew. He, he actually wrote this and then I modified it. Now, so that, uh, so that we get some level of engagement, um, please feel free to comment or make questions in, as, as we go so that we get some of it. As you'll see, um, this, this Gov 2.0 has got a life of its own in the last couple of months. There is a lot happening at the end. I'll give you some examples. So I guess. For some of you researchers, the opportunities are fairly great as a result of this, I, I think anyway. Now, just, just reiterating, if I don't make myself clear, if you have a question or a comment, please make it in the middle. I'll talk for about 20 or 25 minutes, I guess. The first point uh, is that this GARB 2.0 relates to department's data. Now, that might seem like a strange thing to say, but if you Google the Australian government, you can get a list of agencies which comprise the Australian government. The ABS would be one, Geoscience Australia. CSRO is actually in that list, but that list is about, it's about 60 institutions long, and as far as I can tell, in spite of what the task force recommended, which is here, Gov 2.0 relates mainly to departments data, data created for or provided to government departments. And that list is a discrete list. So in, in other words, it doesn't include a lot of things like libraries, schools, hospitals, and cultural agencies. That's why I suggested see that list of Australian government agencies. So Gov2 relates mainly to department's data. What characterizes it, in, in essence, it is an adaption of Web2 concepts. And well, that, I think that will become clearer as we go. What is Gov 2.0? It is government making an attempt to take advantage of, if you like, what's available from Web 2.0. Now, probably everyone in this room is more on top, more likely to be on top of Web 2.0 than I am, although I'm reasonable on IT. Basically, when preparing this, we thought, what is the simplest way to, if you like, discern between those two technologies? One, the Web 1.0, or just Web 1, was, is essentially one way. You put something out there, people can read. At best, they can provide an email back to you. Web 2 is sometimes referred to the social web. And I'll give some examples, but the point of this next slide is that this is only a small part of Web 2. You see MySpace, Facebook, Twitter, and you know, there's, there's just, that's just a subset of them. And there are very, very many users. So this is, if you like, a uh, slice of the social web. But Web 2.0, at least as the government looked at it, um, is a lot more than a social media or medium. It's about uh, sharing and collaboration between users. Now, I've written down a few URLs here, um, and this might be one if you're if you're interested, I suppose. And probably many of you know this one anyway. It's go to web20 or web2.0.net. That is, if you like, a um, a web2, a, a real sort of overview of what web2 can do, and some people would argue that Web3 is on its way. But let's actually get get um, get into this a bit further. Here are some examples of Web um, of Web2 applications, and you can see these are not social network 
um, things necessarily. So there's, there is as big a list here as there were on the, um, the social aspect of it. It is about a two-way a two-way interaction between the people who host the site or create the site, populate it, and those that use it. But this talk, this little talk, is mainly about the GARF 2.0 task force, and we'll get to that and the recommendations of that in a moment. From the perspective of the government, um, which was, this initially started some years before finance and deregulation, uh, that department took the running on it, um, the rationale or the objective um, from the government's perspective was about engaging more directly with citizens. Now, I paraphrase this next one because this is actually a quote, or sorry, it's a paraphrase from the GOV 2.0 <coughs> task force report. It says the overriding aim is to reduce the cost of government web presence. Well, I didn't find that terribly convincing because if you look at some of the government websites, like where I used to be, Department of Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry, you'd be bored to death. You wouldn't go past the first page. It's so dull and often so out of date, to be quite frank. But I think the real reason, the real purpose behind it was to increase the impact of government. And that is really code for increasing the effectiveness of government. Now, we'll get into some examples. And uh, there are some pretty powerful examples out there now of where governments have basically taken a, a different view of engaging with the people they're supposedly governing or providing policy for. So I would say, and listening to Minister Tanner talking about this, the main reason is not really about the cost of the websites, but it's really about improving the effectiveness <coughs> of government. By the time uh, the task force was initiated here in Australia, I must say that other government reforms were already underway in uh, two, the, the previous two years, 2008, 2009. And having said that, um, again, I'm keeping this uh, quite simple. The report, which I'll link, link you to later on, goes into this in a fair bit of detail. In the United Kingdom and the USA in particular, this idea of Government 2.0 is several years old and really has a life of its own. The state of California has really done some amazing things. I mean, they really have, in some ways, changed the way governments relate to people. And it is quite something to look at. Now, I must say, there's also some pretty powerful speeches from President Obama when he came to power on his view of Gov 2.0, and they are, they are really worth reading or listening to. The common theme of these uh, is the release of more public sector information um, and the enhancement of opportunities for its sharing and reuse. So deeper, deeper underneath this more effectiveness of government is this idea that if it's public sector information, remember I've reduced that down now to essentially government departments because public sector is a lot bigger than government departments, but at the moment the emphasis from government is on government departments, and I know I'm reiterating a bit there, but the common theme is the government saying if it's being paid for by the department or for the department, then it should be available for use and reuse. And I'm going to show some examples of that. There is a great belief among some ministers in the present government that there are both economic and quite deep social benefits of doing this. But the economic ones, I think, are also fairly strong. Having it used and reused, there are great benefits, and those benefits can be measured different ways. Another uh, feature of this is if, for instance, a department is making strong policies, let's say on biosecurity, it is much more convincing, I think, from uh, the public's point of view to see the data on which those decisions and policies are being made. And uh, I'll show you a couple of examples of that fairly shortly. Any other questions so far? Yeah, um, Am I going too quickly is another thing, because I don't want to do that. Great. Does GAP 2.0 cover all levels of government or just federal? I will get to that, actually. Um, the drive, I, I would say that the drive appeared to be coming out of the Department of Finance and Deregulation and the DISA, Innovation, Industry, Science and Research. But you'll find the Queensland government um, has pushed very, very hard on this. And if you want to 
look at an initiative. It's called the GILF. Not a particularly snappy acronym, but if you look at GILF, it is basically an automatic licensing of Creative Commons data. So the Queensland government is, <coughs> I would suggest, half a lap ahead of the other state government. So it really, it is filtering down in some ways, but it, in terms of the states, they're all onto it, and some states are, are really pushing hard on this. I mean, it, it, it really has a bit of a life of its own. Yes? Uh, can I just get a clarification? Maybe I wasn't concentrating, but at the beginning, you were saying, is it all government departments or all government agencies? I didn't get your distinction. That's a beautiful question. It is uh, both. It, it is, uh, as best I see, uh, it is the Commonwealth government. So all agencies? Yes. Okay, yeah. So the Bureau of Rural Sciences, which is an agency with inside of DAP, is covered. But the response of the individual agencies differs. That list of agencies is government departments and business units inside that, but that's a great question. And when we get to the Freedom of Information Act, which has just been uh, amended, you'll see that that covers the Australian government, which is also code for the Commonwealth. Um, back just briefly now, um, well, we will be well, well within time. Briefly, the task force, the task force was, uh, it ran for six months. <coughs> I just want to check that I did not miss a slide. No, it was late 2009. I just failed to mention that. It ran for six months. Now, it commissioned a number of additional reports. We're now speaking about the Gov 2.0 task force, which was chaired by uh, Dr. Nick Gruen, a very prominent blogger and economist. Um, this one you might want to take down if you're interested in the additional projects. The additional projects, some of which were referred to in the recommendations, some not, but some of these are extremely interesting examples of e-research and applications. So uh, you could just um, you could just Google Gov 2.0, just Gov 2 will do. But it is Gov it is Gov 2.net.au projects. Again, if you got onto the DISA website and just Googled Gov 2.0, you would find the uh, Gruen report as well as the commission reports. There are about 12 or 13 of those reports. It ran for six months, and uh, if you take six months away from that date is when it started. Its report was released on the 22nd of December uh, last year. There are 47 recommendations. I don't suppose you would write this down, but if you Google the Gov 2.0 task force, you'll find it there. It's under finance. It's also on the DISA website. 47 recommendations. I'm not going to go through those, uh, mercifully, but I will go through the ones that might be of interest to you. And these are they. I'm going to start at the bottom. The Freedom of Information Bill has just been amended has just been passed. Now, in essence, the bill has now changed the balance of power from all of those levels of what you have to do to get information. It's basically flipped the whole thing over, saying the default is the commons. This is, a, this is a big shift. To have legislation behind this means that it is more than just vaporware in someone's mind. Now, I have not been able to obtain a copy of this revised bill, but I'll get back to this in a moment. In essence, unless there are overriding reasons, if it's public sector information, meaning department and agency information, there must be a reason why it's not going to be available through the Commons. That's a very, very big shift. Okay, let's just go through the recommendations of them all. These are the ones that I think are of interest here and generally. Number six, make public sector information open, accessible and reusable. In recommendation seven, while addressing the issues um, in the, uh, if you like, the conduct of copyright in Australia, that's a pretty complex set of laws, the default now is the commons. Now these are the recommendations from the report, but in, in parallel with this, which is why I read the bottom one first, 
the FOI bill has been amended to reflect these changes. That happened only about a week or two ago. Um, what, what do you mean the default is the Commons? Um, it means that if a department, if a department has had a data, has commissioned a data set or created a data set, um, the default for that data set it is, is that it is to be made publicly available. That's the default now. Whereas before, you had to mount a case why you, why you want to see you know, DAF's data. So now, unless there's an overriding um, reason, and it's and as I understand it, that's not code for keeping things the way they were. An overriding reason could be a biosecurity reason, a health threat, security defense, but the vast majority of the data would not be covered by those. So the default now is the commons, and that is by far the greater proportion of data collected by all four agencies. How do you see this affecting departments that charge for data? Is there data? Uh, yes. Is there a business model? Look, when we get to Geoscience Australia, I'm going to give you a couple of examples. The, uh, the, hopefully, I said I'd finish well under time, and I will. Maybe we have a bit of a chat about that. Can I, can I put that one on notice because there might be a couple of departments, there is no mechanism yet. If a department creates lots and lots of data and like the ABS has done and puts it in the commons and finds people using it and reusing it and in a sense that is measurable in terms of GDP, there is no mechanism for the ABS to go to DOF and say look what we've done, fund us a little bit more. So there is no mechanism yet for them to recoup the cost of doing that. Although the cost in terms of GDP is, sorry, the value for them in terms of GDP is very clear. So hopefully we'll pick that up in the discussion. Particularly when we get to the end. Um, this again refers to government departments and agencies. They, um, the recommendation was that information, there was a scheme for the publication of information. The, um, requirement is now there must be planned. So the agencies or, or departments are now <coughs> required to have annual <coughs> plans for how they are going to publish their data. It is going to be one of the, the means by which the departments affecting this is, is being looked at and measured. It will, of course, eventually trickle down into funding for departments, but there's no direct mechanism for that. And as I'll show you in the next slide, there is no funding that came with this either. So that might cause you uh, concern. Um, very explicitly here, I won't go into detail uh, uh, here, but in, within those 47, I think, recommendations, um, one of them is very strong here, and that is that whilst there might be a great deal more data deluge, if you will, in the Commons, um, the privacy of individuals and small groups must be protected at all costs. So there is no alteration. No individual by any means must be able to be identified, not by differences or by sectoring or any of those statistical techniques. So the rules, those rules about protecting your privacy have not altered. If anything, they've been strengthened slightly. And that probably is a fair bit of, a fair bit of necessity given that the default is effectively the commons. I think that covers those points. The response, though, there was, you notice there was actually quite a number of months between the, uh, if you like, tabling of that report and the response to that report. Now, I won't go into it in, in detail simply because we don't have time and I've covered most of the, most of those, no, all of those recommendations on the previous slide have been accepted by government. Interestingly, if you want to follow this part of the debate, um, search for AGIMO, which I think stands for Australian Government Information Management Office, interestingly run out of the Department of Finance and Deregulation. So in, the, in a sense, the Gov 2.0 seat is in this organisation called AGIMO or AGIMO. So if you Google AGIMO, you'll find that that it has um, provided a response, essentially in agreement with the recommendations of the task force. There are some, if you like, caveats in this. The implement 
transportation timetable is not specified and there is no specific budget, being very coy words, aren't they? No specific budgets, that's code for the agencies are going to have to, at least in these abstemious times, the agency is going to have to find the money to do this. This is going to become government policy, it is. It has legislation, but it will filter through the public sector. You have to have plans, annual plans for publishing data, not all the way, but certainly significant parts of it. You have to have a timetable, um, you have to have an annual plan, you have no budget. Now, here are two, here are two modern um, web presences, if I could use that term, on the government response. So just again, Google a GMO, which is in Minister Tanner's department, an authority or agency within Minister Tanner's department. Now, a little bit more about the Creative Commons and data can be found on the ANS website, and here is, um, here is a page, I think, yes, this is a page from the ANS website. Again, just Google ANDS, I'm sure you all know all about what the Australian National Data Service does, but there are some, there are some interesting, there are some interesting things about the Creative Commons, and here I'm putting up this slide because whether it's AGMO or whatever department, um, slowly but surely they are going to be required to make a significant part of their data holdings public and in the Commons. So Freedom of Information Act has been amended. It only took a couple of weeks to get through its readings. So there is a change, if you like, in the way people are thinking about the availability of data and the value of it. Do the recommendations specify if it's just to new data or to apply to retrospectively data that has been passed? Um, it doesn't specify, and that's again, that might be something for an interesting discussion. Um, it doesn't specify, but it implies starting today. So I think that probably, I think, um, Dr. Gruen or Nick Gruen and his task force, I think they are aware that, for instance, if we just take the Bureau of Meteorology, prior to 1957, most of the weather observations are on paper. And I think they are aware of that. And the cost of digitising those is phenomenal. So I would say that there will be some, the Australian Bureau of Statistics so have kept their data in an information warehouse for the last 10 years. They will probably try and go back as far as 1980 because it's all electronic, it's not specified, and there's no budget for it. But that is a very interesting, very interesting point. Now, I wanted to give just a couple of examples, and um, we're going to be well on time. We've only got a couple more slides. Um, when when discussing our first, my first uh, cut of this little presentation with Margaret. Um, she suggested to me uh, wisely that I might try and dig up a couple of examples. Well, I didn't have to look very far. I just draw your attention. I mean, don't you love when people put up slides on, with this size <laughs> pitch and ask you, say, oh, you can't read it, but, well, this is actually pretty important. There is the Creative Commons. That is, if you like, the first level of Creative Commons, which is merely attribution. This is a screenshot of Geoscience Australia, taken last Friday afternoon, I think. And down the bottom it says, unless otherwise noted, all Geoscience Australia's material on this website is licensed under the Creative Commons Attribution 2.5 license. <coughs> now, topographic mapping, earth observation, geodesy and GPS, Marine, coastal, oil and gas, mm. carbon capture and storage, onshore energy. Let's just have a look. Now, here is, this is really showing my background in the physical science. This is these electronic maps called Geodata 250K, two, uh, 250 metre resolution um, map of the whole country available for $90. That cost thousands of dollars a few years ago. Thousands. It was set $100 a map sheet. That gives you an idea of just 
the extent to which Geoscience Australia's view, and I hope this will tie up with your question earlier, their view is that by putting out data sets like these, and one of these is a digital elevation model of, of the whole country on a 250 metre grid, nine seconds of arc, I guess that would be. By doing that, they are seeing spectacular use and reuse of people creating products. And ironically, the demand for and the revenue from these products has gone up as a result of taking you know, you had sort of 50 sales at $20,000, now they have thousands of sales at $90. It just, it's just an interesting, I mean, I, they haven't turned over the books to me and say, have a look at this, Greg. I hope you can still add up. But that is basically, these were some of their most important data sets. Now, we'll tie this up in the next minute. I have a pretty annoying habit of repeating myself, but I, I think it is important to send the message that everything that we've been talking about so far is about government data. And our focus, and here I'm talking about ANS, is not really about data, but it's about researchers, the people doing the work. So there's nothing in GOV 2.0 or the FOI that says anything about museums or libraries or those non-government organisations and institutions. But now to tie this up, hopefully, about researchers, the people, rather than the means and the tools and the toolbox, I must make reference to the code, the Australian Code for Responsible Conduct of Research. Well, I'd be right in saying you all know about this pretty well, don't you? Okay, probably better than I do. You can see it is backed by, if you like, the big end of town in terms of, certainly in terms of funding. And the only reference that I could find in the code about the commons or about the use and reuse of data is this one, and this is a quote. The potential value of material for future research should be considered. That's it. Now, I don't want to be controversial here, but that is, that is a long, long way short of amending the Freedom of Information Act and saying to government departments that starting tomorrow, meaning in your annual plans, you now have to have a publication schedule of your key data sets. Not just a schedule, you've got to actually do it. Not all of it, but significant showings out there in user land, essentially free. So you can see now, and that's what I'm, why I'm putting up, this is the second last slide. Um, I'm putting this up because you can see that there is now um, a, a disparity, I suppose, between um, the data that is funded by, by government, public sector information, and data created <coughs> by funding through the tertiary sector, essentially. So these two are not, they're not in sync with each other. So of course it begs the question, is it time to amend the code to some extent to reflect where 2.0 and government 2.0 are thinking? That's just a question. And it has to be, I have to finish on this slide. Um, this is a quote from Hector Barbosa. And he says, the code is more what you'd call guidelines than actual rules. Welcome aboard the Black Pearl, Miss Turner. If you know that scene, it's a funny scene. That's it. We're one minute under time. Questions and comments? That was a No, no, well, that's it. Sorry, Margaret, forgive me, but I just had to look at that slide up there. So you don't think I'm just too serious? You better not take a video of that one, though. You probably breached off your own. It's for international purposes. You're not recording of it. <laughs> 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 I hadn't got your wallet. What are that? <laughs> um, yeah, just a, a couple of no, comments, I suppose, just on the, the nature of Gov 2.0. I mean, there's a, a bit of a tendency to sort of imagine that it's all about technology, and that you know, and, and the often uh, put about equation is that Gov 2.0 is not Gov plus with 2.0. I mean, it's it's um, looking at ideas of participation and transparency more broadly, um, uh, not just about sort of specific technologies for enabling participation. And that goes over to other sectors as well. I mean, we have now a movement called Archives 2.0, which is not just about applying with 2.0 technologies to archives. It's about rethinking notions of authority and transparency and participation um, it, you know, across uh, what uh, happens in archives. So I think it's important to make that point that it's not just about technology. Also, that uh, it's not just a top-down movement. Um, 
you know, we had the government task force and we've had great things happening in the US and UK. But in, in some respects, they were actually a response to what people were already doing and activities that were already in place. You had things like the Sunshine Foundation in the US, which was working to extract various types of government data and do things with it and show people how they could, uh, you know, interact with government in new ways. Um, and in the UK, you had things like the Fix My Street, if you've seen that, which was a, a new mode of sort of interacting with local government. Um, so you had these things already happening. So it, it, um, you have, so Gov 2.0 is also about sort of citizens seeking to take control of information and do new stuff with it. And, you know, to bring about, and it's that notion that access to data can actually um, change as modes of participation. Uh, it enables new forms of transparency. And in the Gov 2.0, you know, ultimately that it really sort of can influence the nature of our democracy. And there's probably some interesting parallels to tease out there mm -hmm. in relation to um, re the research sector, you know, the sorts of things that Robin was talking about yesterday about how e-research can actually change the nature of research. Um, you know, in, the, in Gov 2.0 we're talking about changing the sort of nature of democracy, I suppose. Um, and also just, a, a, just one other thing to, to point out, um, is where this sort of activity is happening. Uh, you might like to check out um, some of Kate Lundy's stuff as the Centre for the ACT, and she's been very active in this sort of area, um, so it's worth checking out um, some of her things. And she's had a number of events called Public Spheres, which have started to address some of the, the issues around uh, Gov 2.0. Um, and there has been some discussion recently about a possible public sphere on data sharing. Oh, and one other thing, <laughs> sorry. Um, oh, no, you've got this. <laughs> um, uh, as part of the task force activities last year, of course, some of you may know that there was a site set up, data.gov.au, which was about exposing um, government data sets. And so there are a, a number of data sets there. Um, it, at the moment, they're in the process of thinking about how that site is going to develop. And, uh, you know, at ANS, we've got to think about how we. Uh, interact with them in the development of that site, but it's, if you haven't looked at data.gov.au, it's probably worth going and having a look at that and thinking about what they're doing and, and how they might evolve. Well, that's beautifully said. Um, if you go to the task force report, um, all the things that Tim mentioned are in detail. Um, for instance, the change in the, if you like, the power and opportunities of democracy um, takes up about 10 pages of the report. So I, I really have taken, if you like, a very practical and rather pragmatic slice to it. Um, but what Tim says is absolutely, absolutely true. The report, a large part of the report goes, it goes into detail about democracy and, and the, if you like, the opportunities for citizens and the opportunities for public servants to actually engage online. I mean, this is quite amazing, amazing stuff. So thank you. I absolutely agree. I think this gentleman here might have just. We are heavy users of your stats data. Yes. I assume they're not putting it all out on day one either. I have two questions. One is how do we influence which data sets they put up first? And the second question is we're also very heavy users of a data set called Curve, which is a bureaucratic, absolute bureaucratic nightmare from government. And it's absolutely private, absolutely confidential data and you have to sign your own away in blood because you'll never do anything. With <laughs> Second one off and say I don't know. It's very. I, I the second one you might address to Claude this yeah. afternoon because yeah. she's in charge of our diversity and health program, so she may have a better um, answer. To <coughs> but the the the, the 
there is an answer. I was actually a director of the ABS uh, at, at the beginning of its uh, opening up of unit records for researchers. Um, the, they have an information officer now who you can contact and, and therefore potentially lobby and influence about. A, ABS has been extremely proactive. Uh, under the, I think under the guidance of Dr. Suming Tam, is headed up, if you like, the GOV 2.0 ABS perspective. So they actually have an information officer now who can be contacted and what they will not do um, is release unit records. So there's been no alteration about, if you like, individual unit records, so that's gobbledygook. Unit records are your census form, your form. Your form is now um, assigned a block code, which is probably 20 houses, and that is aggregated to something else. So the ABS is at least now able to take um, data from these unit blocks or mesh blocks, an ID borrowed from New Zealand, I might add, and aggregate up to a shape that you might have for a particular reason, purpose, delivery, medical thing. Now the question, that's, that's your second question, the one about these really sensitive medical records, are absolutely and totally out of my depth. I would not. Claire might be able to help. Margaret might have a view, but I... I absolutely don't. It's very liberating to say this. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I think a lot of it comes back to the fact that the implementation of these um, of these recommendations will occur within the within the relevant authorities, mm -hmm. and ANS would not have a role in um, within that, and unless we were specifically asked to provide advice on a particular set of issues. But I mean, we, we, ANS would not be going into ABS and saying we think we should do this. No. And this is not data that's ever going to go to the Commons. Can I just ask? Yeah. <laughs> sort of more, more broader question. I mean, uh, in terms of the, the public sector data people, there's three of us here. And that, I mean, I think we'd be interested in hearing researcher use cases where, you know, you've got researchers who are interested in particular types of government data and what they're interested in, it sort of be interesting to us to hear those sorts of examples and those use cases. It's not just using it for research purposes, I think they have a lot of use, like we, I love to get my hands on a lot of the DEMA and VISA data about universities and what they're doing, at the moment mm -hmm. you have to pay for that through DEMA to, you know, to use data requests, but it would be interesting to know what's going to be available to get up and publicly available. So. Mm -hmm. I can give you an example. If, um, what some of our researchers would, would like access to, and that's the indigenous information that is with whoever is the old national parks and wildlife. They've got a whole stack of, of um, data and information that would be useful for anyone in that field. Okay. Sally, so uh, I saw a couple more. Sally and this um, gentleman. I was just going to say that there's going to be a bit of between the government's desire to have Gov, Gov 2.0 and their political um, activities, because no sooner did the My Schools website go up and somebody took the data away and represented it, the, the government had this reflex action of, no, they mustn't do that. Um, and yet, under, and I don't think that was charged for by this other mashup that somebody had made. So, under Gov 2.0, they should really have just have butted out and let it go. But no, they weighed in and uh, heavily told them, no, you mustn't do it. So uh, I suspect if, if this kind of um, making everything more available does also spread into the university sector, we will see the same kind of tension there. So, oh, well, we want to share everything, but, but not that one. We gave you this data, how dare you charge for it? Which and they said, well, we yes. took this so data. What they should be allowed to do. Yeah, they took the data, they, they massaged it, they produced a product. So so that it's probably on the same topic. We, we could we do whatever you like. So so I actually know the folks who put that the, the uh, My Schools website up. And they, they were actually lobbying the government that they should release it under linked data principles so that people could take it and mash it up. The reason it crashed the night it went live because we, the, the newspapers were scraping the website. So if, it, if they'd actually followed Gov2 principles, the site would have been fine. That's an interesting anecdote. <laughs> just uh, well, we've got obviously a few more a uh, few more questions, which is great. But just bear bear in mind those that, that cautious um, um, 
born in from Margaret, and that is, and it's very uh, appropriate, that we're not a lobby organisation, we are a facilitating organisation. We are about making the infrastructure happen, so we don't go and lobby um, departments or agencies. I mean, we may well put in a submission to NH and MRC or ARC about amending the code, but that's just completely appropriate, but we wouldn't be going in and uh, banging on Sue Ming Tam's door and saying, listen, this data from the last census, we, that's not our role. So just a, just a sort of a, a caution, because we are playing a fairly um, delicate role in that, if I could say that. Sorry, now, that wasn't directed at you at all, by the way. You didn't get to ask. Sorry. <coughs> yeah, I was, I was just going to ask um, about the Bureau of Meteorology. They have a lot of data, and a lot of people really want to get at that, but that's why they absolutely refuse to release it. And we are reason, as I understand it, is that in the past they've been sued by somebody who's going out in a storm, and they've relied on information from the Bureau, which was never intended for much a while, but, but people have been sued, so they're very reluctant to release that data. So is that a, is that a reason for not providing data? Uh, no, no, this? no, no, I, I don't think I think that's a, that's a bit of a top spin on that one. Um, the, the two cases, I'm not sure I want my answer to this to be recorded, to be honest, if that's possible. The two cases, uh, and I was involved in both of them, where... It affects the mandates, like people at home have to get out of their environment. If it's the case of the Freedom of Information Act, that data has to be released, it's less than the need for mandates. That's a, that's a fantastic question. I would say, this is my opinion here, but it's not an Anne's opinion, it would be about interagency rivalry. It would be about saying we will have, um, uh, if you like, the expertise in observing environmental data, or should I say maintaining it? But my private, um, my private answer to that would be they did such a good job taking on water that it seemed it seemed because of the extremely competent organisation, it was only logical that environmental data, which is an expansion of the area unit, would be added to them. But I would suggest that crowdsourcing is the thing of the future for environmental data. It won't be stream gauging and that kind of stuff. If that's what you're hinting at, I think it's spot on. And there's also a follow on too with um, companies like mining companies, for example, that do environmental surveys. There's, I think it's a three year time period they have to expose this data, which isn't is there going to be a continuation on to yeah, companies like that? I'm Starting with BP, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> you would think that if the world is changing, if, if the world of government is changing, the government view, and that goes through the governments and states, you would think that eventually there would be a culture change within those, that sector as well. <laughs>